Okay, the chime has announced 1230. So I think we are at uh, point of beginning. Uh, my name is Whit Bodman and uh, I'm glad to be here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, Rabb al-Alamin, rahman Let me begin again. We are coming upon the season of Christmas. This is not a Muslim holiday, of course, according to the Islamic calendar, though the miraculous conception of Mary and the birth of Jesus are well attested in the Quran. And of course, the presence of Christmas is unavoid unavoidable. It is everywhere, conveying an expectation that everyone in the celebration, regardless of tradition. Imam Santa Claus is coming to town. We will also hear some attention given to loneliness in this season. For some, this time produces a poverty of joy. Can, there can be any number of reasons for this, unhappy losses in times past, absences, abusive presences, family dynamics, or just a tendency to depression. One does not have to be Christian in order to experience any of these. They are all manifestations of some sort of separation, an absence of love, of safety, of care, or whatever surfaces a turmoil within. A short time ago, Usama gave a sermon focused on the orphan and the larger issue of children. I want to revisit that topic with a different agenda, because if we look at the presence of loneliness in this season, we are looking at the experience of being orphaned. The lonely are bereft. My mother died when I was 57, no spring chicken and I was 61 when my father died. In the most basic sense, I was no longer a child, maybe even a touch beyond middle-aged. I was shocked, however, when the idea occurred to me that I was now an orphan. One normally thinks of orphans as children, but here was I, fully adult, with children of my own feeling not just sad, but orphaned. One thinks of Muhammad, peace be upon him, whose father, Abdullah, died before he was born and whose mother, Amina, died when he was six. He was an orphan. He was given into the care of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, who died when he was eight. So he was orphaned at birth, orphaned again at six, and a third time at eight, thrice orphaned. He was then given into the care of his uncle, Abu Talib. When his uncle died, he was orphaned yet again, even though he was an adult at the time. In that same year, he lost his beloved wife, Khadija. It was the year of sorrows. With the death of Abu Talib, Muhammad lost the important protection that his uncle had afforded him in the hostile environment of Mecca at the time. Though he was, Muhammad was a fully grown adult at the time, his uncle acted in many ways in the role of a parent, a protector, authority, a guide, a comfort. Abu Talib is even credited with poems in praise of Muhammad, even though he never, or perhaps according to some stories, only on his deathbed, 
become a Muslim. After my parents died, I still experienced the urge to call them with a particular question. Who was that person we visited on Long Island? Will it still work to use 2% milk rather than whole milk when making Spanish cream? How did I react when you told me that we were moving to North Carolina when I was 10? Parents not only give knowledge on the basis of their long experience, they are also the keeper of memories, including perhaps most importantly, the memories that inscribe our own stories. They are the keepers of our childhoods. When they die, that is gone forever. There is much about our own selves that we will never know. Even when others in the family die, our stories are lost. I have longed to ask my uncle about my parents when they were young. What were they like? What was I like? But that opportunity is gone. All of that is, I guess, pretty depressing. Though it does remind me that my own children, my own nieces and nephews will have and I must remember to do my best in various ways to tell the stories, to fill in the blanks. My younger sister was far more organized than she was in and recorded a conversation about my mother's childhood. And I learned a great deal from that, correcting some blanks. Answering some specific questions like where a large German Bible came from, it just seemed to appear. I no longer feel like an orphan. I am much more conscious of the fact that I am the custodian of the stories of my children and of my nephews and nieces and many others. I know much about their parents that they do not know. Some of it, of course, they ought not to know. I will never tell them. Oh, is their story what has formed and shaped their lives? Chaplain Nusama has made story the basis for his spiritual conversation. We are narrative readers. Our lives are stories of many chapters, many experiences that shape us in ways within and beyond understanding. He wit. Exercise in probing who we are and why. Wit, I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I think you're covering your microphone. Oh, sorry. No, you're perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> All of this is quite practical. It describes the ways in which our stories and our lives are intertwined. There is another way in which the loneliness of an orphan may strike us. We may feel at times orphaned of God. And here I turn to that great saint of Islam, Jalal ad-Din Rumi, whose great work, the Masnawi, has been called the Quran in Persian. I was once at a conference in Tajikistan, of all places, on the occasion of the 800th anniversary of the birth of Rumi. At the final banquet, each person was invited to come up and give a little speech. There was a short, compact man from Tehran who came up and began to recite Rumi in Persian. Soon after he began, he suddenly leapt up and shook a bit and fell down to the floor. People rushed to his side to see what was the matter. It turned out that he was subject to short epileptic fits. In a moment, he fully recovered, stood up, and continued reciting from exactly where he left off. Such is the power of Rumi. The words of Rumi were imprinted on his soul. During that time, we heard many people reciting passages, poems from Rumi, from memory. 
the passage that haunts me, that excites me, that sticks with me is at the very beginning of the Mathnawi. It is in a sense, the premise for the whole of the epic poem. Here are the first words. Listen to the reed, how it tells a tale, complaining of separation, saying, ever since I was separate, separate, severed from the reed bed, my lament has caused man and woman to moan. So it begins with the image of a stalk of a reed yanked out from shallow water, severed from its roots. The poet laments and all around man and woman share in that lament. We are severed from God, from our root, from that which feeds us, nurtures us, gives us life. We are set apart from our source, our creator. We are orphaned. We may not experience this all the time. When we kneel in prayer, we may feel the closeness of God, but we may also not feel that. It may be that we call out into the silence, lift our prayers to the skies, and silence remains. God is not subject to our demands, not always to our needs or to that which we think we need. The Quran tells us that God is as close to us as our jugular vein. We know from Hadith that as we walk towards God, God runs towards us. God is ever and always responsive, but not always in ways we understand or even apprehend. Rumi continues, I need a breast shredded by parting that I may unfold the pain of love desire. Whoever finds himself far from home yearns for the time of reunion. He says that we need this experience of loss, the pain of longing, even to the point of a shredded heart. He continues, in every company, I uttered my wailful notes. I consorted with the unhappy and with those who rejoice. Everyone became my friend from his own opinion. None sought out my secrets from within me. This verse has always unsettled me. Everyone thinks they are my friend, but they do not truly know me. What does that say about my friendships? Are they so shallow? Do I think that I am the true friend of others? Do I fail to seek out their secrets? Should not our secrets be protected and thus remain secret? But what kind of friendship will not seek out the precious secrets? What kind of friendship does Rumi expect to hear? What does it mean to be a friend? Even my closest friends do not, I should admit, know me. Certain vulnerabilities I hide, the deepest desires of my heart, I don't even know how to share. They remain clouded, not just out of the fear of exposure, but even more so, from the limits of articulation. Words fail, even the words uttered only in my mind. As Rumi says in the next verse, my secret is not far from my complaint, but ear and eye lack the light whereby it may be apprehended. Body is not veiled from soul, nor soul from body, yet none have the power to see the soul. True, the truth of my soul is hidden even from myself. And then Rumi dramatically shifts from the theme of complaint to one far more energetic. Classical Persian lacks the exclamation point, but one can see it everywhere. 
This noise of the reed is fire. It is not wind. Whoso has not this fire, he is nothing. It is the fire of love that is in the reed, the tumult of love that is in the wine. The reed here, this reed stalk torn from the reed bed is now a flute sounded not merely by breath, but by fire, by passion, by spirit, by love desire. Some say that molten lead was poured through the reed to clear out the joints, to smooth the pipe so that wind, breath, could sound its way through clean and clear, and that is the explanation of the fire. Others say that the fire causes the reed to disappear in a cloud of flame and spoke such that only the sound is left, only love, only need. And such the mystics talk about the disappearance of the self so that all that is left is God. Rumi continues, the reed is a friend to all who are lovelorn. Its melodies have torn our veils apart. Whoever has seen a poison and a cure, a mate and a longing lover like the reed, whoever has seen that. So what is all this to say about orphans and about the orphan within each of us? There is no more powerful description of the feeling of being bereft than what Rumi has given to us here. No one has the power to see into our soul. It is alone. Rumi, of course, does not simply want to leave us in this swamp of despair. He wants to awaken us, awaken in us the fire of love. But the fire of love is rooted in longing. The lament of the reed is a melody of longing, the longing for home, the longing for God. It is only God who can be the true friend. It is only God who can indeed see the depths of our souls. It is only God who knows our secrets, even the secrets we keep from ourselves. Only God. God says to Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Surat al-Imran, say, if you love God, follow me. God will love you and forgive your sins, for God is the forgiver, the merciful. I have long pondered what it means to love God. How does one do it? It is a fundamental of faith in Judaism, in Islam, and in Christianity. It is a foundation. It is hard enough to know how to love another human being though. Loving God? Yet, loving God brings us home. This verse is not truly a conditional. It does not mean that God will only love you if you first love God. God and God's love does not depend on our love. God chooses for God's own reasons, far beyond our understanding. It is rather that our love for God opens the awareness in our hearts of God's love for us and God's forgiveness. God's love does require action, the action of following the example and leadership of the prophet of God peace be upon him. One does not truly love God if that love does not result in right behavior. But is right behavior without the love for God enough? It may be enough for forgiveness, but it is not enough to resolve the loneliness of separation. God, the Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, there are many people who take others besides God as equal to God. They love them as they should love God, but those who believe are more powerful in their love for God. So how does one become 
so powerful in one's love for God. Rumi points out that first, one should realize one's loneliness, a loneliness that no human companionship can relieve. And that loneliness awakens desire. It informs us of our need. As the Quran points out, one can desire the wrong things. This is hawiya, which is loving something other than God, putting something of the world as equal to God. And that will not cure loneliness. It only leads us astray. Rumi says, I need the breast that is torn apart, shredded by parting to give expression to the pain of heartache, love desire. Without need, there is no satisfaction. Without right desire, holy desire, there is no love. And so Rumi, Rumi speaks of thirst, thouk, thirst for God. He says, love cannot be contained within our speaking or listening. Love is a notion whose depths cannot be plumbed. And therefore, we must speak of thirst. What is love, he asks. It is perfect thirst. The physician comes only to the ill. And if our thirst is not perfect, we may thirst to be thirsty, desire to desire. The loneliness of this season, the loneliness of any season, is our opportunity to find the thirst for God. Without the seeking, we are forever orphaned. The seeking, is the gift. The need is the finest gift, truly a gift of God. Thank you.